Hi, everyone. We're live. Uh, I, I'm going to start off with a few introductions. I want to welcome everybody to our research and tech talks. Uh, we have a pretty incredible guest. Before I do introduce him, uh, Dr. John Nash, I'm going to do a couple of items of, of housekeeping. Uh, the first is um, if you are with me on uh, our Facebook educators group or uh, our YouTube live broadcasts, please do use the chat um, for Q&A. We can uh, grab your questions from there. It also let, lets me know um, that you're with us. Um, a few quick things. I am going to uh, use these nifty post-its that I put here to remind myself. Um, a couple of things I'm putting into the chat right now. If you are not a, um, a member of our research and tech group on LinkedIn, if you're there and would appreciate um, updates from the research and tech department at NAF on uh, the latest in research and conversations that are meaningful to our field uh, via your LinkedIn feed, join that group. There's a lot of stuff that we are releasing there um, as we see it, not just from NAF, but uh, from around the field. Uh, so please do join us there. Other thing I'm gonna link to right away is uh, a book chapter of Dr. Nash's that I wanna make sure that everybody has access to. Um, that is going into the chat as well. And I will also leave them in the notes for this chat. Um, so without further ado, I wanna introduce Dr. Nash. Uh, John Nash is a native of the Bay Area in San Francisco and has lived in California. John, you have lived all over the place. I don't understand how one person lives in all these places. Before settling in Kentucky in 2011, the pathway through those states included traditional academic training and an academic career. He turned on its head when he resigned the day after he was rewarded awarded tenure at University of Texas El Paso to join a startup lab at Stanford called the Stanford Learning Lab. Never one to stop learning, his worldview was reschooled and retooled at Stanford when he exposed when he was exposed to design thinking from those who would later found the D school. From there, he took a departure from higher ed altogether to run Silicon, a Silicon Valley arm of the Stockholm Sweden-based consultancy that he founded. He returned to the academy when he was hired as associate professor at Iowa State University in educational leadership with joint appointment in HCI, human computer interaction. Today at the University of Kentucky, John conducts research on human-centered design as a means of creating educational innovations. John's passionate about lifting the voice of the voiceless so as to honor their experience and wisdom in designing solutions to long-standing social challenges. Uh, John, Welcome, we're so excited to have you. Wow, thank you. It's great to be here, Mark. Appreciate it a lot. So um, I have a, about a billion questions to cover in uh, the you know 50 minutes or so that we have. And uh, for those who have joined us online through uh, YouTube or, or our Facebook, uh, we have an educators group for our network on Facebook. Um, I want to encourage everybody to drop questions. You don't have to wait till the end to drop questions in the Q&A. We can work them in as we go. As I told you, part of the, the thrust of these talks is really about bridging uh, research and practice, something that you've committed uh, lots and lots of your work to. So you certainly, uh, you were somebody who was extremely quick to accept the invite, I think in part because you get what we're trying to do here and make sure that the best thinking um, out there in the world of research and design and, and, and practice are all sort of cycling together into what we see as an important, uh, the, the gumbo, the, 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 uh, the, the mashup of things that make uh, true innovation and progress. So where I wanted to start, Dr. Nash is, I'm gonna call you John, if that's, if that's okay. We've, Absolutely. You don't seem like a terribly uh, of the letters kind of kind of guy. So so I'm going to uh, call you John, if that's all right. And um, yeah. where I wanted to start is, so what is a design thinking ninja doing in an ed leadership program is my first question. 
You know, that's um, that's a great question. That's a that's a story of the evolution of where design thinking gained a foothold over time. And I, I think I think of it this way: is that um, well, you know, design thinking emanates from a long-standing history of a work that emanated in the you know in the well in the '60s and in the '70s. You have participatory design coming out of Scandinavian labor work and then uh, movements into uh, the Bay Area and thinking about what IDEO has done recently and then in the, the D-School. And, you know, as, as the D-School started to make design thinking become more popular, it started to edge into other areas outside of traditional designerly work or industrial design. And so while IDEO was working on squishy handled toothbrushes for kids, which is which came out of a design thinking work, um, it starts to also gain a foothold in thinking about tricky problems that are happening in the developing world, for instance, uh, and how might we address issues of uh, clean water or farming issues or uh, health issues in developing countries. And then it starts to creep into education a little bit. Um, we start to see some uh, interest in trying to have kids become design thinkers. And that seems really interesting to a lot of people. And so that we start to see this move into the schools and then thinking about teachers being design thinkers. And as this is starting to happen and I start to got, I finished at Stanford and was at Iowa State University, it struck me as I was working at the time with my colleague, Scott McLeod, who's now at the University of uh, Colorado at in Denver. Um, in the, the Center for Advanced Study of Technology Leadership and Education, um, uh, that the the thing about firstly, we were, I was very interested early on in the ways computers were used in schools, and the mantra at Castle uh, with a was um, if the leaders don't get it, nobody will. And what struck me about where design thinking was going was that it was it had hit in sort of uh, it, the developing world, the nonprofit sector, it was starting to hit in education with kids and teachers, but it didn't seem to be yet around thinking about how schools are organized or how leaders think about facilitating schools. And so um, I started to look at ways in which design thinking could be used as a lens for leadership in education. And so that's how it sort of ended up sense. It seems to make so much sense to me now to think about uh, leaders using a designerly lens for their work that um, would continue to just develop that work. Uh, a question is, whose toolkit does design thinking belong in in education leadership? Is this uh, is this for teachers? Is this for principals? Is this for something else? I think one of the things that I've discovered over time in um, teaching design thinking and uh, and talking a lot about design thinking with folks is is that folks hear design and they think it's somebody else, right? It's it's kind of like that phenomenon where. Um, same phenomenon when you talk to people and they say, "Oh, I'm not a math person, or I'm not a not a creative, right? Uh, right. Go, go talk to so and so for that." Um, I feel like it it for whatever reason it puts people in in somebody else's mindset. But in your mind, who who does design thinking belong to, and and in whose toolkit does it belong for ed leadership? Yeah, great question. And I and I have a side story to your notion that because I also hear people say, "Well, oh, I can't draw." Um, and we draw a lot in this work. Uh, I think I think it fits in a lot of people's toolkits and you know what the notion of leadership is within a school in my mind is pretty broad. Um, the thank you for mentioning my book. you know that comes out at a time when teachers and school leaders really realize that solving the challenges that face modern schools is less about, um, making good decisions, although that's good, <laughs> but it's more about facilitating this collective coordinated action on the part of teachers, students, parents, community partners, everybody that makes up the stakeholders of a school community. So as far as where or whose toolkit it belongs in, I'd say that the mindsets, and this is interesting because design thinking really isn't even just a tool unto itself. It's a, it's an amalgam of tools and mindsets. And I'd say that the mindsets uh, of, you know, uh, radical collaboration, uh, uh, 
uh, bias for action, um, uh, uh, proto uh, cultural prototyping, et cetera. Um, those belong with everyone. And the steps in the cycle is you know, being empathetic and then uh, defining the problem with empathy and pro uh, brainstorming, et cetera. They're not linear, although they appear in a linear fashion a lot of times. They don't have to live together um, all the time. They can, I say, you know, start anywhere, go everywhere. So most, most of the time, if you're trained about design thinking, you think, well, we start with need finding and empathy, and then we move on to this next thing. And that's fine. But, you know, I also love Boyle's Law, which says never attend a meeting without a prototype <laughs> because, um, because, you know, just showing something to someone that you've made, that starts an empathetic need finding cycle. I mean, so, so I think that there's, I think if we think about, it can be daunting for a school to say, oh, we wanna take on design thinking as a way of working and way of knowing and doing. Um, and so if you can unpack a lot of that stuff and just say, there are little bits that you can do every day that are parts of it that still take you down a path to goodness. Uh, it doesn't have to be the whole toolkit. Is it is it uh, safe to assume that uh, can be found in in the book? I just wanted to bring it back up again. Um, a leader's guide to collaborating for improvement. So you mentioned things like empathy and other aspects of the design thinking cycle or process. Um, are these the kinds of things that people can access in design thinking in schools? In the book, yes. Right, and so um, what I've attempted to do is put, you know, this isn't the first piece that's gone out there to try to tackle the use of design thinking in schools, but what I've tried to do is make the approach approachable uh, by offering a toolkit of those pieces that I think are most doable by, um, by educators and put it in a series of events that are couched inside a story of a school going through it themselves so that they can see themselves in the problem, see themselves in the solution process, and then carry out those, those tools successfully, hopefully. One of the things I know uh, comes up, uh, not just in the book, but um, in lots of spaces around uh, when when you're you hear folks talking about design thinking is this concept of radical collaboration. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, you know, being that I, I held you up as a ninja, uh, I thought we're better to get our definitions than the uh, than the most belted of our um, members of the, the design thinking universe. So what is radical collaboration? How do you define it? To me, radical collaboration is at its core, the idea that you should be collaborating with the folks who could likely have great insight on a problem and aren't usually invited to weigh in on the problem. Um, I, I recently joined a, a group um, called Design Justice and I was their principles mirror a lot of what's good about sort of the design thinking mindsets, but they they have a couple of things I'd like to point out, which I think are worthy of thinking about when we talk about radical collaboration. And one of them is, is that it's also related to being human centered. And their second principle of the design justice group is that we center the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. Mm. So we're making sure that those people are close to us. And then this, their sixth principle is that we believe that everyone is an expert based upon their own lived experience and that we all have unique and brilliant contributions to bring to the design process. I think that's beautiful because what it does is it says that um, you don't have to have society's letters after your name in order to be considered an expert in a particular domain or a situation. And so for me, I think that uh, radical collaboration is this idea that um, you're, you're keeping, it, it's a play on that human centeredness. Human centeredness means I'm keeping the people most affected by the design process to, as close to me as possible. And then I'm collaborating with them. So it also goes along with this notion of co-design, which is where the, the users in the process, the people who are, you are designing for, whose life you are making better. Which by the way, I might add that I also believe that design thinking is, is a process by which you make someone's life better. That's really the purpose of it. And so, um, but they're close to you and they're designing with you shoulder to shoulder. They're co-designers with you, so. 
I, I, um, some, some in, in the doing the homework for this, um, this conversation, one of the things I was noticing in some of the other projects where I've seen, um, design thinking being integrated into the context of school leadership, um, were educators saying over and over that, uh, we didn't realize until we had this group together and started talking about design thinking that, um, we're designing all the time. And design thinking and this process, these cycles, um, while it helps a ton to get deliberate about what the steps in those cycles are, are something that was actually a lot more, uh, they were a lot more native to in a lot of respects than they assumed. Is that something that you see a lot of when you're working with educators? That they they notice that they are designing or... Yeah, and and that th some of these steps, even if by a different name, are things that you know whether they're working on building curriculum or uh, working on the environment in which their class is happening, or their after school programs are uh, intervening in certain ways, or or whatever it is. I I wonder if um, these are things you hear, you know, that it's like getting familiar and sharing a common language, but otherwise the experience is somewhat familiar. Is that is that something you see a lot of? I see it. I don't see a lot of it. I have to be honest, and I, it's maybe that's a little that's a little troubling. But you know, but I do see it. And you know, where I s tend to see it is in schools and programs who have elected to put a service learning component in their curriculum, mm. because it's in those cases where I see them uh, working to augment and improve those service learning components by having the students have a have a radical collaboration mindset in thinking about the challenges that they'll tackle in their community and the way in which they'll engage the folks and the stakeholders in the uh, devising of solutions for that challenge. Um, but, you know, but I have to say, I'm, and I don't mean to sound pessimistic, but we're here, it's 2021, but um, schools still tend to be fairly top down in the way in which they determine what kids' lives are like inside them from the, the the day pattern to the curriculum to what have you. I'm not saying there aren't pockets and there's opportunities, but I think that's also why design thinking is such, has such a rich, rich opportunity uh, right now in schools. It's it's um it's terrific and I appreciate the 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 real talk because I think you're right. Um, that too often there's a lot of top down and and uh, you know the it, I don't know. I, I'm curious if you would agree with the statement that that um, you know, ed leadership programs like yours are unique, right? And um, this is not something that is a part of every ed leader's toolkit or experience and in, in sort of being trained into the institution. And so uh, there's a lot of work to be done to sort of um, you know, sort of right side that dynamic of of how design happens rather than being top down, being uh, sort of grassroots in a in a sense. So um, so the statement is uh, the institution is is the way it is in many ways by design, and um, it it feels like in some ways where the the um, beauty of human centered design is that it helps us sort of undesign things that aren't working for the end user. Right, right. Yeah, it's like I have the sticky on my desk here, and I'm sorry I don't know the I can't attribute the quote, but it's it's that it's that every system is designed to get the results it's designed to get, and mm. so um, I think that um, what we also take for granted as school leaders and in schools and just as teachers and just maybe as humans is that we we take for granted that the things that we have around us um, are as they must be. And so um, I'm thinking um, about Larry Leifer, who I worked for at Stanford, who went on to help co-found the D School. Um, yeah. His wonderful quote is, uh, all design is redesign. Mm. And I'm constantly reminding my students that everything around you is and was designed by someone, except maybe the trees and such, but that everything, and so therefore it's ripe for redesign. Someone else made this before you got here. That doesn't mean that you don't also have the power to remake that or make it better for those around you. Uh, but that's something we tend to take for granted that yeah. because it's already here, then it must have to, the system must work this way because it was handed to me this way. No, it doesn't. Yeah.
You you mentioned Larry Leifer, and and it's a good moment to talk about Stanford a, a tiny bit. Um, I, I'm curious whether that's where you saw what the potential of radical collaboration looked like. Is 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 that the moment? Uh, your time at Stanford, was that what helped you sort of see a, a path for the work you wanted to do as being in this space of ed leadership? Yeah, definitely. I think, and maybe it wasn't that that's where I saw the potential of radical collaboration so much as, I mean, if we're, as long as we're on the topic of these sort of mindsets, mm -hmm. I, Stanford is where I really saw uh, show, don't tell, and the culture of prototyping. But I think that... Um, the group I was working with and uh, the things that we were doing uh, were a, de a departure from the way I had been trained in my doctoral program in a leadership program with a fairly you know, quantitative, positivistic style of thinking, uh, now getting to a place where, um, where the ways in which we develop knowledge and determine what's, what's real for others is vetted all in the lived experiences of those others. Uh, and then and knowing whether we're on the right track or not didn't involve uh, you know, memoranda and charts and tables, but actual you know, physical manifestations of the things we wanted them to have in their lives and getting their reactions to that. And that just, sem that just seemed to strike me as, as a much more sensible way to think about how we might work with kids in schools eventually. I mean, as I got to Iowa State and started to think about how this might be integrated into educational leadership and now here at, at Kentucky. But, um, you know, schools are a fascinating place when you think about it from a sort of a, a human-centered design uh, prospect, and particularly this, this notion, um, as I think is so well put by the design justice group, which is that, you know, we center the voices of those directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. Schools are designed to teach kids, and yet we ask them nothing <laughs> about what they're, you know, what they think that experience ought to be. We, very little, anyway. Um, we give it lip service, but we don't really do it wholeheartedly. What's what's tell me about some of the um, about some of the magic that you've seen come out of uh, whether it be radical collaboration or other aspects of uh, this this process. I'm I'm curious to hear you just talk a little bit about um, ways you've seen the process come to life in the context of um, of education. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, maybe it's even we could consider a little bit the longstanding state of affairs that make us want to be a little more collaborative. You know, I've seen school districts where the, they approach problems and with ideas that are essentially adopted due to their success in another district, just mm. keeping up with the Joneses. Maybe you've seen this happen. Sure. Um, it's a, you know, a plan gets proposed uh, from the near uh, top of the hierarchy. Um, the design sprint book that we're using now, um, you know, they, we call those hippos, highest paid person's opinions. <laughs> and we try to, we try to avoid the hippos, uh, but they'll go, the hippos go get the materials and somewhere along the line, the motivation that's necessary from the teachers and the students just never materializes. And so, you know, when ideas are taken from other districts, uh, they're not by their nature really well suited to really meet the unmet needs of another district per se. You know, I've, I've met high school students who um, feel it is almost impossible to sit down with their principal and talk with them about school. They just, they consider school leaders so, so untouchable and out of reach that they're, that they would be just, the students are just completely disconnected. And then, you know, teachers who work in districts that where money is thrown at a cause and like literacy or maybe multitudes of literacy materials are purchased and shipped out to the schools. And then they tell me that those materials lay fallow. They just end up you know, hmm. gathering dust. Who decided to purchase the materials? Well, the teachers certainly weren't consulted about it. And so, so, so that's like, oh, that's so dire. But I've seen superintendents invite non-traditional, non-academic participants to be a part of their cabinet, for instance, schools, um, that are led by superintendents that, you know, they have very associate superintendents of instructions or school levels, most with advanced degrees after their names. And in Eminence, Kentucky, the superintendent there, Buddy Barry, who's a dear friend, um, he invited the heads of transportation and the heads of uh, maintenance and food service mm. into the instructional cabinet, non-experts. But actually, no, they are experts. And they're experts at seeing the kids in through lenses that those other people with society's letters after the name never see and get insight and collaborate with them on what we should be doing in schools to make it a great experience. 
That same superintendent, by the way, interviewed every kid in their school. Now, small school district, but still it was 600 kids. I mean, and did, you know, wanted to know what were their unmet needs? How was school going? I mean, and then started to make policy out of that. Um, I've seen middle school students collaborate with school principals in my workshops uh, to design human-centered ways to make school more sticky and more interesting for them, bring mm. more human agency to them. And um, and some really interesting uh, stuff that we played with, but we haven't been able, we haven't taken it far enough yet, I think. But I've seen preschool teachers empathize with pre-K kids, four-year-olds, and even infants, and by using um, character composites and personas made through the proxy of the teachers who spend time with them every day, we envision ways in which uh, young, young children could be partners in collaboration for school space, school curriculum, and school design if they are given the kinds of empathetic attention needed to understand what their needs might be and how we can understand them better. Hmm. Do you have, I wondered um, if you have a favorite, um, a favorite empathy story. What I mean by that is, is when you usually when you, um, you know, you hear a lecture on, on design thinking, or you go to a workshop, maybe uh, if you have the opportunity, and, and you always hear a, a, a solid story, because I think that a, a lot of times when we when we hear empathy, we're thinking like, well, I can skip that step, because I know what, what air quotes, my teachers need, or I, I know what my kids need. So, so how is how is the empathy you're talking about the the process of empathy the doing of empathy different um, than mm -hmm. that version that I just described? That's a great question, and I was like, not a minor panic. I was like, God, what would be the story? <laughs> and, and I, but I think I have one. I don't know. This story means a lot to me, and it may. I don't know if it'll land with the everybody's watching or who will watch and listen. But this, it's a small story. But I think it, it says a lot about what we try to do. And I'll preface it by saying, I think that the best points of departure for great design are when you can understand how someone wants to feel. Mm. And, and how you get to that is not, there's not a direct line. And so there's a very, very popular introductory exercise for design thinking called the Wallet Project. It was developed at the D School. And I use it quite often with my students to, to introduce a design cycle to them so they can get an idea of what design thinking is like and practice it. And, uh, and the, the Wallet Project works, if you're not familiar with it, roughly as follows, is that the, 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 the ruse, as it were, sort of the, the false start is that you're going to design a better wallet for someone. Hmm. Uh, but really, the use of their wallet is a, is a gateway for you to understand who they are as a person and what their needs are. Because right. the, the first instruction is introduce yourself to your partner by taking them on a tour of the contents of your wallet or purse. Hmm. And so these people who ostensibly maybe know each other in class, but maybe they're chiefly strangers to each other, are getting out their wallets and emptying their wallets in front of each other and yeah. showing them these stuff that they would never show. So, um, so we, and so sometimes the students will start to talk to each other and then they'll say, well, I don't really know what I need or I don't know what my needs are here. And one young woman who was in my, one of my principal leadership classes, um, her, uh, her, uh, wallet or purse was a she had a very nice purse uh, uh, that she'd recently bought recently mm. um i think it was like an yves saint laurent it was a very high high beautiful brand purse yep. and she started talking she was talking about how she loved that purse and you know at first blush you might say well she loves it because it's you know a great brand or whatever like that and so they were stuck so i started to explore i said well tell me a little more about why you love this person what it means for you as a person she says well i just i bought it because i thought i wanted i wanted to have it so well tell me why did you, and we start to do a five whys sort of thing we ask nice. again. and we say well i'll just so it turns out that um this young woman was recently divorced her marriage had fallen apart she hadn't felt as though she had any notions of independence and she didn't wasn't of high means she was a school teacher aspiring to be a principal but she bought this purse because to her it was a symbol that she was going to be okay and that she was going to have some level of independence after this traumatic event in her life wow and boom now we were able to think about well now we understood 
what was behind this person what and what else she needed. And then so her partner was able to leverage some of that in a way that she could design something that ended up not being a wallet or purse at all, but something that was meaningful and useful for her in her life that she could use to make her life better. Hmm. So um, what's interesting about the good, um, the good empathetic work is that you're able to find out things about what people need to feel good about themselves and about their lives um, and do it in a way that is safe because the, these sorts of interviews also, when they go this path, they make the user feel a little vulnerable. I mean, you're maybe revealing to yourself, to a stranger or whatever, these, um, these, these ideas. But that's where you can start to really understand what the unmet needs are of folks and then start to think about designing things for them. Mm. I, have, I have another one to add to your, uh, add to your kit, give you, give you time to take a sip of water. Um, one of my favorites is I've heard, uh, I, I had the privilege and, and pleasure to work with, um, some folks at IDEO, which people hear a lot. I think it, uh, it is a, uh, now a global design firm and, and this process is being used in, in commercial contexts and, and all kinds of really interesting spaces. At, at one point I heard them, uh, we were doing a workshop for a group of, of teens on human centered design. And, and, um, one of the designers at IDEO was telling the story of how, um, they were hired to develop a, a um, or pursue the idea of a set of beauty care, a line of beauty mm -hmm. care for men. And um, they had a group of people that they were set to interview and, and uh, the designer was spending some time in the apartment of a, uh, a gentleman who works on skyscrapers in New York. And um, so he had just come in from work. He's, you know, this is half uh, how I picture it, but uh, I did see a picture, um, you know, uh, strong looking dude who clearly is spending his days uh, moving iron and, uh, you know, doing the things you do, uh, putting up infrastructure. And the interviewer said, um, you know, uh, do you use any beauty care products? And he he kind of like laughed and said, uh, "No, I don't. I don't use beauty care." And um, they kind of carried on with the interview. And as the designer was starting to walk out of the room, he sort of pointed around the couch and said, "What is that?" And he said, "Oh, that's my foot bath." <laughs> and so the the great the great part the thing I loved about this punchline or this this moment was um, that that sometimes the need um, is is not what's um, is not what's said but what's observed and um, and that was one of the things that that when I've had some of these conversations with students and educators and and other people when you talk about empathy it's it's one thing when you observe um, or or use observation as a sort of tool mm -hmm. in empathy some really interesting other other things come out and this this Definitely. purse purse story is such a, a such a um a rich one i love that um so you've said i want to talk a little bit more about process just so that folks mm, leave sure. with a sense of what this looks like um you've said it's not just about convening students and listening to them so what is the work and in, in your mind what are what are one or two things that are happening if folks are engaging this process in the context of education yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I, I think that the new competitive advantage for leaders is what I'm just sort of terming facilitated listening. And that, that is listening that's facilitated by the tools and mindsets afforded in design thinking. And so I think if educators could realize that they need to get on the same level as those for whom they are trying to solve problems, they would then start to actually ask the people who are being affected by the challenges that exist in the school. And so they don't need to look at themselves as experts. They need to look at people they are trying to help as the experts. So um, it's, uh, you know, I just ran, uh, I just ran a, a version of the, the wallet exercise with, an, with a group a couple of weeks ago uh, in one of my university classes. And the, um, uh, what they came, what these 25 or so aspiring principals came away with was that the bar was so low to understanding what students' needs are, and it's just that we have to ask them. But somehow we've decided that you know this gets answered by you know principal or superintendent uh, 
student voice groups or mm. listening groups, you know, and things like that. But it's not so much the the questions that um, can only they only may take five or eight or ten minutes. But you have to ask the right questions, and you have to ask maybe why a lot. I think that the my experience is that when an educator engages in a design process that includes some empathizing with the user and really get to know them as a human being, and then they design something that makes that user's life better, um, their ability to um, use design thinking as a mindset intensifies dramatically and their ability to find time to do it also miraculously increases. I think mm. that's the one thing I've noticed over time is that when, um, I mean, design thinking is as much a fad as anything right now, I suppose. And so if a school is very serious about taking on as a way of working, it's time intensive. It's, it's I won't lie, it's a slog at times. And what I've discovered is that when you can get leaders to even go through something like the wallet project or, or, or a shorter say of sprint of work that maybe I might facilitate, um, and all of a sudden they're able to find the time to do design thinking. Hmm. because then it becomes something that they see as a as an advantage to the way their their school can achieve its outcomes yeah there's there's something magical that happens when um there's there's a switch that that flips i feel like when uh folks get a little deeper uh, you know a step deeper into the process and suddenly realize how how much value it can bring mm -hmm. you mentioned the five whys earlier um and because we have time to come back to it i want to can you just describe how that works because i've i've found that to be such a helpful device in facilitation and and all kinds of of contexts sure uh it's deceptively simple but very it's simple to talk about but harder to pull off uh but yeah. it's it's when when you ask a question of your partner uh, that you might be interviewing for for in the sort of the unmet empathy unmet need need finding empathy phase um you ask you ask the question why uh and you do that five times one for every subsequent response to the why before it and what it does is gets you to a, a, a state of root causes, as it were, fairly quickly. But it also gets you very, it gets you into a pretty vulnerable or personal space pretty quickly too. Mm. Short, short story on that, not as, not as maybe impactful as the story of the young woman with the purse, but I, we were running an exercise like this and I was with an associate dean and, and, and his, uh, his assistant were partners in this and they were going through the wallet and he had a lot of uh, receipts in his wallet. And his, his partner said, well, why do you have so many receipts in your wallet? He said, well, I need to keep track of my expenses. Why do you need to keep track of your expenses? He said, well, uh, because in my family, it's important that, you know, my wife wants to know how, what kinds of things I'm spending them on. Why does your wife want to know why you, know, keep you what you spend your money on? Said, well, because she thinks I spend too much money. So after about three or four whys, we were in from the wallet to the marriage. Mm. And so now we're starting to think about, well, you know, wh where are the points of departure for design from that? Rather than you don't need a better wallet, you need, well, you might, do you need a, you need a <laughs> relationship? <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that that's, that's what's, um, and so I, uh, I think maybe in my book, but also just, it's easy to share. Um, but I've come up with X, like synonyms for saying why, because it can feel a little silly to just say, oh, why, why, why? But so um, I've got ways for students to say it three or four different ways. It doesn't feel like you're just being uh, pedantic and drilling down. Mm. That's so good. Um, so so you talked a little bit about um, bringing students through this process, and I want to um, actually talk about some of the like what's going on at University of Kentucky and and um, and in the D lab and uh, so so as a way I I hope it's a way in but um, one of the things um, one of the things folks might actually uh, discover let me let me find <laughs> so one of the things that I dug up in in this process, right? It, it's from uh, Wreck This Journal, and apparently there's a class uh, uh, in your program called Wreck This Class. Um, I thought it would be a uh, a fun way to talk a little bit about what kind of experience students are having and and uh, what it looks like to be an education leader in 
in training uh, with with um, with you all at at uh, in Kentucky. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm delighted you found this. This cracks me up. Um, so actually, this was in my my design thinking for education class, and I but I assigned Wreck This Journal as one of the books for the class, and had students take uh, a stab at the exercises in this book uh, as a way of uh, socializing them to some of the mindsets in design thinking. And then I think you found I started a Tumblr called Wreck This Class where they could post what they had done with the uh, wreck this journal. Got it. And, um, but I think it's, um, it's great because this fits for me with this idea of um, what Jonathan Kozol calls mischievous irreverence. And it, it also kind of fits with, with Larry Leifer's notion that uh, all design is redesign. And so what, in design thinking, you have to be able to re-see things. You have to be able to creatively reframe everything. And so um, Wreck This Journal forces you to redesign the book. Uh, not, not the book, not that book, but the notion of book. <laughs> <laughs> it just it doesn't become a book anymore. Um, and in this particular image that you were sharing, um, it says, I think it's, you know, document your dinner and then rub it all in there and then use this page as a napkin. So, I mean, I don't know how people feel about their books in their house, but this is the last thing most people would do with anything that resembles a book in their home. Um, and so it gets, it gets students to rethink what they're looking at and whether everything in front of them is what it should be used for also. It kind of reminds me of like, if you don't hack it, you don't own it mm. sort of thing. Um, and um, I, it's, when I was thinking about this, I thought about uh, something that um, Abby Covert says, and she has this great book called How to Make Sense of Any Mess. And there's a passage of that. If it's okay, I'd just like to read from that. Please. It fits. But she says, you know, if you rip the content from your favorite book and throw those words on the floor, the resulting pile is not your favorite book. And if you define each word from your favorite book and organize the definitions alphabetically, you would have a dictionary, not your favorite book. <laughs> And if you arrange each word from your favorite book by gathering similarly defined words, you have a thesaurus, not your favorite book. And so um, everything is not what it seems and everything doesn't have to be what it's for. Mm. And I think that's what was trying to get at as, as students start to use this in their, in their, plus this is what most of them are teachers and educators who wouldn't defile a book if you could put a gun to their head. So this right. is a lot of fun. And yet, if you check out the Tumblr, which uh, that is one among several items that I will put in the description on YouTube when this goes up, um, in addition to things like Boyle's Law and uh, Abby Cobert, um, <clears throat> I will I will make sure that all of these things are uh, are linked up there and and. Uh, um, it sounds like a terrific, um, it sounds like a terrific, uh, I've seen the Tumblr, the Tumblr's outstanding. It sounds like a terrific, uh, device to get your class mm -hmm. sort of, um, all on that same page about, uh, what the value of deconstruction in this context is going to be. So I'll put the, I'll put the Tumblr up. I know, I know it's, um, it is, I think it's a work in progress maybe, or, or from, past classes it's been past classes and I'm, I'm thinking about resurrecting it i'm always i'm i'm always evolving too <laughs> right right it's it's outstanding so um i want to invite if if there are questions um online we have a few folks in the chat and i'll i'll invite questions there um the thing that i really want to make sure that we do before i um you know i want to be mindful of time is give you a chance to talk about this uh chapter so um you're interested in this the nexus between designer and user and the creative empathetic dance between the two, which reveals insights that can be leveraged into solutions that surprise and delight. And we've talked a little bit, that's, that's I'm quoting you, um, it, it, we've talked a little bit about um, data viz and, and some of the, the ways that you're thinking about um, adding to the toolkit of education leaders. Can you talk about the chapter and, and just a little bit about that as topic? Yeah, sure, happily. Um, that's a chapter written by uh, me and my uh, partner, uh, Beth Rouse, and it, was, it appeared in the uh, Handbook of Research on Communication. And so 
which was an exciting thing for us to be invited to write on because um, we were able to think about the design thinking work that we've done in the past in a, within the frame of how does communication work uh, in design thinking? And there's lots of ways that it does. And we struggled to think about what we wanted to focus on. And ultimately we thought about the ways in which uh, the ways in which the designer and the, the co-designer, the user, the person for whom they're designing or designing with, uh, how do they communicate? And how do you get this, this important thing, which is goes to uh, the young woman with the purse or the, the academic with his wallet or whomever it is you're designing for, how do you tease out the, the tacit unmet needs that they hold within them and make them explicit and in what ways can visualization help uh, augment that process? So by in, um, the, you know, the, one of the mindsets in, in design thinking that comes out of from the D school is, is a bias for action is there's a focus on sort of action-based work rather than discussion-based work. Although, you know, empathetic need finding involves interviewing and observations. Um, what it really does is it involves sort of the action of this also mindset of show, don't tell, but how can we put down on paper in different ways um, the, the, the capturing of this dance between designer and user and understanding what they need so that it can be brought out and made into new solutions for them that make their life better. So the chapter talks about this and it also, then we we detail about 20, 21, I think, different uh uh, visualization techniques that are used in design thinking and we put them into a topography that talk about or a typology excuse me of how those fall within the steps of design thinking and what their advantage is in knowledge transfer between uh, user and designer hmm. I love it I do have um, I do have a question from the internet um, so, so Deej uh, Chambliss asks us, uh, what traction do you feel this approach to developing school leaders is getting in the higher ed community? I think it's getting some traction. Um, I, I've had good fortune at my own institution to use design thinking to look at some different problems um, from thinking about ways in which we would involve uh, co-curricular programming in the student center to how do we make the student center even more student centered? Uh, we've tackled issues related to um, uh, binge drinking and issues related to uh, tailgate behavior at, at wow. football games. Um, and then also just to um, not so much mundane, but the, but the important stuff that's related to people's lives around how does staffing work in a college and how do we meet the varied needs of different uh, faculty, students and staff uh, in tight times. And so um, all of those, lend themselves very well to understanding the needs of the users and having them be co-designers in the process by which you look at solutions. I think there's a rich, I think it's rich uh, ground for uh, design thinking in higher ed. Outstanding. I want to, uh, I'm going to put one more time. I want to put your uh, book up. Take, take uh, self off here for a second. I just want to also add, and maybe I'll give you a link for the folks, but I saw a note in the chat that the, the five whys was a, um, a tool for root cause analysis in the PAR toolkit and the participatory action research toolkit. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the folks at Design Justice uh, in particular are, um, they come out of a root of not only human centeredness, but in the PAR community. So I think they fit really well and it's really exciting to see those tie in. Nice. Uh, we can put some links to uh, participatory action research is something we've actually talked about in our research in Tech Talks. And we're going to actually have a, a group of um, participants, uh, youth participants in uh, action research from uh, some of our academies in later this spring. Um, so I will put some links to PAR in here as well, which is a toolkit that, that we are working on for our practitioners as well, which is an, another frame. I, I wonder if, if you would consider these, uh, cousins in some ways, uh, design thinking and, and PAR. Yeah, absolutely. Especially to the extent that the participants are involved in, in, in co-design and it's, it's, the research is with, not for. 
uh, on, the, on the issue. So yeah, I would absolutely consider that. Awesome. Uh, John, it has been such a pleasure. I am so glad the universe uh, connected us. And uh, my, my huge thanks for spending time. And I'm gonna have, I have uh, in the chat, I put links to uh, your most recent chapter and uh, I'm gonna have all kinds of description in, in the YouTube link, but this has been so much fun. And I, uh, I really hope you'll come back and talk to us some more as uh, you know, no doubt we will have educators in our network who have questions about um, the Ed Leadership Program and, and uh, hopefully I can, I can send those along to you. But um, John, thanks for joining us and, and this has been so much fun. Thank you. It's been a delight. I really appreciated the chance to talk.